planning a military operation is not so difficult. In combat manuals of the armies of all countries, one way or another, the rules for conducting defense, ambushes and offensives are spelled out in detail. Skillfully combining these ready-made solutions, an experienced commander is able to devise a plan for the upcoming battle according to standard procedures, as if from toy blocks. But as soon as the first tank is put into operation and the first shot is fired, even before the first shell fired by artillery explodes beyond the horizon, the well-devised plan collapses and improvisation begins. The ability to make the right decisions under pressure, relying on incomplete information about the enemy – this is the attribute and skill that distinguishes a good commander from a bad one. And it's for a reason that they say that it is relatively simple to capture positions, though it becomes quite difficult to hold these positions. This is about ATO, the history of war, episode 86. In the spring of 2014, the Russian Federation annexed Crimea, and in the summer its army launched an invasion of eastern Ukraine. As a result of a chain of battles, this attack was stopped, but the war did not end. Diplomacy and espionage, economics, propaganda and fighting – all these are elements of a hybrid war. This is exactly what we're trying to figure out. The advance of Ukrainian troops to the east in February 2016 did not affect the balance of power in the Russian-Ukrainian war. However, having established fire control over the Horlivka-Donetsk road in the Avdivka industrial zone area, the armed forces of Ukraine complicated the logistics of the militants. It is logical that the militants sought to force Ukrainian troops out of their occupied positions. However, in February, DNR leaders expected a strike in the Azov region. As a result, an excellent opportunity for a counterattack was missed. Ukrainian troops were able to gain a foothold in the industrial zone and the battles took on a positional nature. But war is a large-scale event. On March 8, militants tried to capture a Ukrainian observation post near the village of Turhizbenka. A reconnaissance sabotage group of terrorists crossed the Siversky Donetsk River and circuitly approached Ukrainian positions. However, saboteurs were discovered, a battle ensued, and as a result, the militants were forced to retreat. The hotspots of the ATO zone have traditionally been the neighborhood of Horlivka, as well as the Avdiivka Opitna Piski section. At these lines of defense, terrorists used mortars and armored vehicles ten times. The militants usually showed activity closer to the afternoon and sharply increased the intensity of firing immediately after sunset. In total, over a day, 43 cases of violation of the ceasefire regime were registered in the anti-terrorist operation zone. As a result of these attacks, eight Ukrainian soldiers were injured. We note that wherever this did not threaten the lives of civilians, the forces of the ATO fired back. According to intelligence units, in the first week of March, in the battles near Avdiivka, seven Russian troops were killed and another 19 were injured. On March 9, the outskirts of Donetsk remained the epicenter of the armed conflict. Strengthening the success achieved in the Avdivka industrial zone, the Ukrainian troops moved forward and took up new positions near Yasinovata. The so-called DNR press service announced a large-scale offensive by the Ukrainian troops, but in reality there was a fairly modest shift of the front line. It is important to understand here that the Avdivka Yasinovata area is well fortified. Any large scale actions will be accompanied by significant losses of people and military hardware. That is why, in attempts to avoid serious losses and destruction, the Ukrainian army acted in this area very slowly and carefully. Trying to restore the status quo, 
The terrorists used barreled artillery in the area, which was immediately documented by OSCE observers. At the same time, striking at Ukrainian positions, the militants were guilty of negligence in aiming their fire, which led to serious damage to two residential buildings. By pure luck and coincidence, there were no victims. On the Svitlodarsk bulge, Russian mercenaries used mortars and armored vehicles. In Marinka, Hranitne and Hnutove, sniper groups worked in the relatively calm Luhansk direction in the vicinity of the village of Novotoshkivske. During mine clearance operations, a soldier of the 24th Brigade was blown up and died after stepping on an anti-personnel mine. In the area of the town of Shastya, an LNR militant and Russian citizen Vladislav Kondalov, nicknamed Samara and convicted four times, surrendered to the Ukrainian authorities. During interrogation, the militant said that in September 2014 he agreed to the proposal of the Russian Special Services and joined illegal armed groups in eastern Ukraine. As payment for participation in the events of the Russian Spring, people of the FSB promised Kondalov documents without a criminal record and a reward of 15,000 US dollars. However, Russian curators, hoping for an early death of the militant, delayed the payment, and in the end, the money was pocketed. As a result, he was disappointed in the ideals of the Russian world, laid down his arms, surrendered to the Ukrainian authorities, and collaborated with the investigation. On the same day, in the village of Ocheretina in the Donetsk Oblast, another militant was seized. SBU officers detained the attacker, whose task was to conduct reconnaissance on the territory controlled by Ukrainian authorities. On March 10, fighting continued in the area of the Avdivka industrial zone. Trying to force Ukrainian troops out of their positions, Russian terrorists openly ignored previously signed agreements. Mortars were used seven times a day in this area, and a tank fired twice. In addition, anti-terrorist operation forces repelled the attack of the enemy sabotage and reconnaissance group of 10 fighters. Another similar clash occurred on the Svetlodarsk bulge, where near the village of Troitske, Ukrainian troops also engaged and forced the enemy sabotage intelligence group to retreat. In Zaitseve, snipers of militants intensified. Mortars were used in the area of Luhanske and Pervomaiske. Two mortar attacks occurred southward. In Marinka, for unknown reasons, militants fired, presumably from a sniper rifle at the checkpoint. In total, more than 30 attacks and provocations took place during the day, but fortunately, losses were avoided. The next day, March 11, the situation was seriously aggravated. The number of episodes of the use of heavy weapons increased significantly. The geography of the clashes has not changed much. The battles were fought around the Donetsk airport, near Horlivka and on the Svitlodarsk bulge. In Avdivka, a tank fired at the Ukrainian positions early in the morning. Mortars and grenade launchers were used during the day. In the evening, the terrorists used 2C1 Vazdika self-propelled artillery. At the same time, part of the shells exploded in a residential area. In the area of Piski and Opetne, battles also continued all day long. In addition to small arms and grenade launchers, two snipers were registered, as well as fire from a 120mm mortar. Hiding in the buildings in the village of Star Mihailovka and thereby protecting themselves from counter-battery fire, the terrorists fired 54 mortar shells at Ukrainian positions in 24 hours. In the area of Chermolik and Marinka, mortars were also used. In the latter case, numerous episodes of indiscriminate shooting at Ukrainian positions were also registered, as well as shelling of a team of repairmen engaged in reconstruction work on the Marinka Krasnohorivka gas pipeline. Thankfully, none of the repairmen were injured, but the work was suspended. Several provocations occurred in the areas of Shirokine, Hranitne, and Vodane and near Mariupol, a local resident was injured, who was driving a tractor and was blown up by an explosive device planted by the militants. During the day, as a result of hostilities, two Ukrainian servicemen were killed and one was seriously injured. On March 12th, the fighting did not abate. Ignoring the agreements and treaties, Russian terrorists fired on Ukrainian positions in the Avdiivka area. And while in an attempt 
to hide from the OSCE observers, the use of tanks and self-propelled guns was still episodic, the mortars were actively used. Over a day more than 60 shells were fired at Ukrainian positions. On the Svitlodarsk bulge, the use of IFV onboard weapons was noted, as well as the use of anti-tank guided missiles. Here we recall that in conditions of positional confrontation, anti-tank systems were often used to destroy fortifications and dugouts, and not to destroy armored vehicles. A similar situation was observed in the Zaitseve Mayorsk area, near the villages of Hnutove and Talakivka. In the area of the village of Vodyane, one mortar shelling and the launch of an anti-tank missile was recorded. In the Marinka area, occupying positions in residential developments, militant snipers operated. It is important to note that despite the increased activity of terrorists, irretrievable losses were avoided. At the same time, seven Ukrainian soldiers were injured. It should be noted that as a result of intense fighting in the area of the Avdivka industrial zone, Russian terrorist forces also suffered significant losses. Mistakes in the management of units, friendly fire and the actions of the Ukrainian army led to the death of 23 militants in the area during the second week of March. Several pieces of military hardware were destroyed. During the same period, 34 wounded soldiers of the Russian terrorist forces were delivered to the city clinical hospital and hospital number 18 in Donetsk from the Avdiivka direction. At the same time, reinforcements were transferred from the territory of Russia and deployed in the Yasinovata area, in the form of four trucks with personnel, four more vehicles with ammunition, and six BMP-2 units. On March 13, the overall picture remained stably tense. In the area of Piski, Marienka, Krasnohorivka and Zaitseve, mortar attacks continued during the night and were quite powerful. In the Avdiivka area, in addition to mortars, for several days in a row, barrel artillery was used. Fearing counterattacks, the terrorists located their guns on the territory of the settlements of Spartak, Yakovlivka and Yasinovata and fired from several directions at once. During the day there were 43 cases of the use of weapons and with every second shelling heavy weapons were used, which ultimately led to the death of one Ukrainian soldier and another soldier was wounded. On March 14, terrorists showed unexpected activity in the Luhansk Oblast, where for the first time in a long time militants carried out tank shelling of Ukrainian positions in the Novotoshkevsky area. But the main area of tension was the southern direction. Here the militants, under cover of night, repeatedly fired at Ukrainian positions with mortars and also used tanks supposedly withdrawn to storage bases. Unlike the central part of the anti-terrorist operation zone, it was much easier for Ukrainian forces to wage a counter-battery fight in this region. As later events showed, out of 100 Russian special forces who arrived in the Dokuchaevsk area that day, not all returned home on rotation. And part of the equipment, among which were Tiger armored vehicles, was later destroyed. In the Avdiivka direction, the intensity of the fighting decreased, because after spending several days in a tense attacking rhythm, the militants suffered losses, used up their ammunition and lost their offensive potential. But neither in Zaitseve, in Avdiivka, nor in the vicinity of the Donetsk airport, there was no silence. In total, more than 40 shootings were registered per day, and a mortar was used eight times. As has been said many times, the quality of the army often critically depends on the quality of the transport system. And in this case, it is logical that the militants tried to regain control of the Horlivka Donetsk highway and push out Ukrainian troops from their occupied positions. The battle for the Avdivka industrial zone will eventually become the main arena of positional confrontation. The battles lasted over the entire year of 2016 and did not end in 2017.